Greetings, Chag Sameach, a happy festival to you. We're on the last day, the seventh day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. This year is a unique time in, for most of us. We're dealing with a serious health crisis, so we hope and pray that all of you are well who are hearing this and that you'll stay well, that you'll stay healthy. And we're looking forward to uh, a more normal time. Uh, today we're counting towards Pentecost. Uh, this is uh, the fourth day of the week. And uh, so this is, um, uh, the, uh, of course, we begin counting Pentecost on Yom Rishon, the first day of a normal week, which we call in English Sunday, but it has to be within the unleavened day, uh, bread uh, days, days of unleavened bread. So this would be the fourth day, then counting towards Pentecost, which would be the uh, 50th day. It will also occur on Yom Rishon on a Sunday. It'll be coming after a weekly Sabbath. So there's a unique characteristic to Pentecost. It's the only holy day which must be preceded by a weekly Sabbath. And so most years, uh, you know, it'll be the only time you have a double holy day will be Pentecost when you have a weekly Sabbath followed by a Pentecost. But as we count, though, we want to value very much the seventh day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Um, this is the day of the crossing of the Red Sea and very likely of the fall of Jericho. Uh, it's uh, also the final charge, as it were, the spiritual charge, as we then move on, uh, having worked on ourselves a bit more, having been more conscious of being righteous, being less sinful, uh, and uh, we've had these days to focus on that, on focus on righteousness, and this is our final uh, spiritual rejuvenation, as it were, as we press on then towards the mark, towards the kingdom of God. You know, there was uh, a little boy that uh, went to uh, went to Sunday school, and uh, he came home to his dad, and and he said, uh, "Today we studied about the crossing of the Red Sea, and uh, Moses took the children of Israel uh, to the uh, to the Red Sea, and there was a bridge that." Uh, went from where they were to the to the to the land across the sea so they they all were able to cross over that bridge and then they had a special demolition team that came to sabotage the bridge so when the egyptians went across the bridge it exploded and and so they were you know were drowned and the israelites were saved his dad said to him is that what you learned in sunday school and the child said no but You'd never believe what they told us. Thought you might get a kick out of that. Uh, in Je in uh, Revelation 15, but I do believe it. I do believe in that miracle, as I believe, I'm sure you do. Uh, in Revelation 15 and uh, verse, uh, well, let's just go to where, where we see this. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels playing, the se uh, having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is, is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. So here you see uh, the resurrected saints uh, singing the song of Moses. And this, I believe, goes back to a tradition uh, in the Jewish community that the song of Moses, although it was sung anciently after the crossing of the Red Sea, is foreshadowing uh, a, a, a song of the resurrected saints. Uh, I want to go back to Exodus 15, and it's it's interesting there because if you read it, uh, it looks like uh, then it says then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the to the Eternal and spoke saying, and then it goes on you know I will sing to the Eternal for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. But even though it says uh, uh, Moses and, and the children of Israel sang this song 
it looks like uh, that he will sing. You know, Mo Moses, is, it, 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 it is in the singular here because Moses sang it and then the children of Israel um, perhaps in effect repeated after him and, and so the, it's in the singular. But it also, if a person just rolled out of bed who, who knew Hebrew and read it, it would look like he will sing it. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting tense and scholars will tell you that this is a poetic tense that is influenced by the ancient Akkadian language, which is a Semitic language spoken in ancient uh, Babylon and, and perhaps was the language of, of Ur, where, where Abraham was before he moved on to into Syria and then on into Canaan, the Akkadian language. And as it had that tense where you, it looks like the future, but it's actually uh, indicating past. But because it looks like future, when you look at it, uh, the Jews took this to imply the resurrection and Moses and the saints singing this in the resurrection and it's interesting that you have that seemingly in, in Revelation 15 uh, there's one other place where this you find this tense and uh, again it's interesting to me and I find, I find it in 1 Kings 3 uh, and there uh, again it's obviously a, a past event but it, but if you if you read the Hebrew, it looks like it's in the future. But here it, it's First uh, Kings three, and uh, I want to go to verse sixteen. Solomon has been given special wisdom, and now we see he exercises his wisdom in this famous case. But I'm not focusing on the case so much as one verse. Second uh, Kings three sixteen. Now two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. Okay, well this is all obviously. A, a, a section about this problem that they had fighting over the baby but again if you read it it looks like it's future that they will come to the king okay well if that's the case again it, it, is this also a prophecy and I think it is I think the time is going to come when two harlots will come before the king will come before God to, to be judged and uh, we find that in Ezekiel 23 and I'm not going to read a lot of that chapter, but uh, just uh, in Ezekiel 23, we see Ahola and Aholibah uh, in uh, Ezekiel 23. And um, uh, let's say in verse 5, let's look in verse 5. Ahola played the harlot even though she... Uh, Let's go, and I want to go earlier than that. Uh, verse 3. Uh, well, let's, let's start from the beginning. The, wor the word of the Eternal came again to me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, they committed, who committed harlot, they committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were there embraced. Their virgin bosom was there pressed. Their names, Ahola, the elder, and Aholibah, her sister. They were mine, they bore sons and daughters. As for their name, Samaria is Ahola, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is Aholiba. So they are pictured here, the, 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 the two houses of Israel are pictured here as harlots, <coughs> pardon me, that have to reconcile to God. So I think in a sense that verse, although talking about Solomon and his wisdom and those two women battling over the baby, in effect is also prophetic. Now why, why Israel uh, is called the, the elder versus Judah, perhaps because Israel uh, apostatized first. Uh, but the, the word means the greater, and it could mean literally the greater in the sense that most of the tribes wound up in the northern kingdom. That could be the meaning. But we are talking now, or I am talking now, about the resurrection. And the resurrection is really a part of the, of the seventh day of unleavened bread, because it, it, the crossing of the Red Sea in effect, was a, a resurrection. The children of Israel were as good as dead, but miraculously they came out of the sea alive, and the Egyptians were drowned, and the Israelites, you know, were were were, were in effect resurrected. And uh, we have the same situation in a way with with uh, the fall of Jericho. We have Rahab and her people miraculously protected. Everybody else dies around them, but they come out uh, alive. Uh, through the through the work of Joshua, just as, as you know, the saints are resurrected with the coming of our Joshua, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, so there is there is that uh, that that parallelism there, uh, 
the, the Red Sea crossing is, is compared to a baptism in 1 Corinthians 10, and really resurrection uh, is foreshadowed by baptism. We're in the water, we, uh, theoretically we're drowned, we come up, as Jesus Christ, you know, was resurrected, we are in a way resurrected from baptism. It's both a womb and a tomb. It's a tomb in one sense because we kill the old man and come up a new one, and it's the womb in the sense that it's the, it's the uh, staging ground for the renewed, the born-again individual who comes up. So anyway, the, the, these are some of the analogies. And it was during the, the days of unleavened bread, after the first day of unleavened bread, of course, you know, but it, you know, uh, it was during the, the, the days of unleavened bread when Jesus Christ was resurrected and ascended uh, to his Father, and it was very likely on the seventh day of unleavened bread, if you look in 1 Corinthians 15, that it was he was seen by 500 people. The resurrected Jesus Christ was seen by a large number of people, very likely on the seventh day of unleavened bread. Well, if we're going to be a part of the resurrection of the, of the saints, if we're going to be a part of that, of that resurrection when Jesus Christ returns, we have to obviously be disciples of Jesus Christ. We have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord, uh, as our uh, person, personal Savior, our Lord and Master, our High Priest and coming King. And so there are values we must remember as we com complete this festival season, this season of, of righteousness, of, of keeping sin out, there are values that we remember, or value, I'll, I'll call this values to remember. And these values are critical in terms of just basic biblical morality, you know, basic ethics. If you were to, uh, if you were to ask a person why something is right or wrong, you'd be surprised how you finally come to, to wondering, well, ultimately, what does make something right or wrong morally? What does make something uh, right or wrong ethically? And when when you when you you finally analyze it there's something in us that just as we have a sense of what is beautiful and what is ugly you know what sounds nice and what doesn't sound nice what looks nice and doesn't look nice just as we have a sense of that we have a sense of what is right and what is wrong because we are created in the image of god and so we have a conscience now that conscience can be distorted and perverted and that's, of course, why we must have guidance and direction, uh, because it can be distorted and perverted. But people are born with with a sense of right and wrong, and and uh, if, if properly directed, it, it is very important, you know, to uh, let your conscience be your guide. If indeed your conscience has been properly trained, um, in uh, Romans two, um, verse twelve. Uh, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. So there are people who act wrongly, but they know they're acting wrongly, even though they haven't studied the Bible. But, it, it, you know, in various cultures through history, there have been the philosophers and the teachers who, who, who've tried to guide people to behave properly. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, I'm in verse 14, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and, be, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else accusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So everyone is going to ultimately be held accountable and to be judged. And generally speaking, in most civilizations, there is a sense of what is right and wrong. And when people fall short and violate those, those norms, they, they, they understand that in, in many cases that they are. And so they're going to be held accountable you know, to, to, the, to the conscience that, that they have developed. And as I said, it can be perverted, it can be distorted, but Generally speaking, there is such a thing as a sense of right and wrong that we have. And uh, as I said, great philosophers in different civilizations have tried to guide and direct their people to, to act properly, to be ethical. And basically, basically, ethics is living in such a way as to ensure the survival of the human race, but not only its survival, but its survival as human 
is survival the survival of human life with the quality of human life that people w w w should have not just the law of the jungle but but a life of quality uh, and, and ethics would ensure the survival of the human species but also the survival of the human species as a human uh, that would in a sense be the basis of really uh, what, uh, what ethics is all about and there are four basic principles that we need to keep in mind in terms of our lives being guided by the scriptures and uh, back some years ago an international organization that is devoted to charitable work uh, the Rotary International developed what they call the four-way test and first they ask is something the truth is it the truth if we, this is a test for what we think what we say and what we do and and so they came up with is it the truth well we know that we're not to be dishonest and I want to go just to one verse uh, in Colossians uh, 3 and verse 9 Colossians 3 and verse 9 uh, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So a converted Christian is not a liar. Now, one of the principles of ethics is autonomy. Each human being is, re is entitled to respect as a human being and not to be used a a as the means to an end of another human being. What gives us the right to manipulate somebody else? What makes us inherently better than somebody else we can manipulate that person. If we deceive that person, we've taken that person's uh, ability to make a decision away because that we've distorted that w w that person's database with, that they're going to use to make the decision. We've taken away that person's autonomy. So that so autonomy is an ethical principle, and so we are to 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 be truthful. And the scriptures tell us. Uh, now uh, another. Uh, principle is fairness. Is what we think, say, or do fair to all concerned? Is it the truth and is it fair to all concerned? Now, as I said, each individual is entitled to what is, what is, what is due that person as a human being. We, we are to be fair and we have that sense within us, that sense of something not being, not, something's not being fair. Uh, we have that sense within us, and it, it needs to be developed. And God, through the Bible, through His Word, uh, and through the Spirit working in our mind, can can help us to understand better and better. But I want to go to Deuteronomy 16 and verse 20, where it says, "Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, righteousness, righteousness, you shall pursue." Uh, I want to go to verse 20, uh, 20 of Exodus, Deuteronomy 16. You shall follow what is altogether just that's the way it's translated that you may live and inherit the land which the eternal your God is is giving you and we know um, from uh, Mar from Matthew 7 the golden rule uh, Matthew 7 and verse 12 where Jesus says uh, therefore whatever you want men to do to you do also to them for this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule. Treat others as you would want to be treated. So we have fairness, we have autonomy, and then we have the principle of justice. Autonomy and justice. As I said, another way, to, the way the Rotary uh, International worded it was, is that the truth is it fair to all concerned. Uh, I was uh, given a degree, PhD in religion and social ethics. An ethicist would say there's the principle of, of um, of uh, autonomy and there's the principle of of justice and um, another principle is will it build goodwill and better friendships whatever you think say or do will it build goodwill uh, will it build goodwill and better friendships uh, what you what you what you say and do in other words is what you say and do going to undermine things? Is it going to uh, impede uh, progress? Is it going to cause hurt? Um, the uh, This golden rule that I read, Hillel, who preceded Jesus Christ, he taught Gamaliel, who taught Paul. Well, Gamaliel was Hillel's grandson. 
and Gamaliel taught Paul. Hillel, Hillel lived until Jesus Christ was was probably in his teens. He died around that time. And the way Hillel put it, it put it was, you know, what is hateful to you, don't do unto your fellow human being. You know, he worded it in a negative way. What is hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. And so this is the principle of of non uh, maleficence. You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to cause harm. Don't cause harm. That's something that that of course in the healthcare profession is one of the principles that 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 guides their directs what what they do. Don't cause harm. Do no harm. I, I want to go to uh, Romans thirteen. Romans 13 and verse 10. Romans 13 and verse 10. It says, Love, and of course we understand from the biblical point of view, love as unselfish, outgoing concern. And uh, of course, 1 Corinthians 13 has a very powerful, uh, you know, it's a very powerful statement about love from the biblical point of view. And in, in, in Romans 13.10 it says, Love does, does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So if we do no harm to others, then we are, you know, we are fulfilling the law. You know, we're being uh, righteous according to the Bible. So this is the principle of non-maleficence, that we don't, um, we don't want to harm, uh, we don't want to cause harm. Uh, you know, kind of reminds me of the uh, prayer of Javet of uh, Javits, Javits, but uh, I don't want—I don't know if I should turn there or not. It, it uh, I believe it's in First Chronicles, the fourth chapter, and uh, he, uh, his name in effect was kind of a play on words. Perhaps uh, his mother had a difficult uh, pregnancy. Uh, so his name, it, 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 it kind of is a play on, on the word for 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 uh, for pain, um, but uh, in first in uh, First Chronicles four, um, um, I'm going I'm going to go to the tenth verse of First Chron First Chronicles four. Years ago, somebody wrote a book just based on this on this verse, and uh, uh, Jabez Javits. Uh, called on the God of Israel saying oh that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain so God granted him what he requested you know he wanted to be blessed but he also wanted to live in such a way that he did not cause pain to others that was his prayer and God did did honor that prayer first chronicles 4:10 so this is, again, a principle that is important in ethics, a principle of non-maleficence, do no harm. And it's also, and of course, it is a biblical principle. So we've, ta we've talked about autonomy, we've talked about justice, we've talked about non-maleficence. But now there's, there's another principle, and that is the principle of beneficence, of doing good. If you have an opportunity to do good, do it. And so the final point, in the four-way test, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerns? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Is it beneficial to all concerns? To all concerned, you know, is, uh, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Is it beneficial to all concerned? That's the fourth point there, and uh, the way we would express it as as ethicists is the principle of beneficence. You want to do good. And uh, I want to go to uh, the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter. And in the tenth verse. So he says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we want to be effective. We want to be uh, to do good to all, but especially those who are the household of faith. So we have that principle of, of beneficence, of doing good. So let's, let's backtrack to what I talked about today. 
this Seventh Day of Unleavened Bread causes us to think about the resurrection because as I said Jesus Christ was resurrected during these days of unleavened bread perhaps appeared to a large number uh, during uh, on this day this day pictures the the Israelites as good as dead going into the sea yet the sea splits and and they come out on the other side a, a kind of resurrection of a baptism which is a kind of resurrection and it pictures uh, the how the, the 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 people of Jericho all died, but yet Rahab and her people were were spared. So in effect, they were uh, resurrected in that sense, and in the sense that they were spared the destiny of all the others. They were in effect the the, the uh, you know the righteous who were spared, and uh, in effect, the, uh, we 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 understand that most people who've lived and died are going to just have that experience of having lived and having died and will not necessarily be resurrected when Jesus Christ returns. The, the, those who are part of the first fruits will be resurrected when he returns. Others will not be. However, the good news you know, for, uh, for us and for them is that they are not lost because there is a judgment period coming when all who have lived and died, you know, who, haven't had, who haven't made that decision, you know, and that's the vast majority of the of the human race. You know, will be resurrected during a white throne period, uh, as we call it, the white throne judgment period in Revelation 20. They'll be resurrected, and at that time, they will have the opportunity to live the right kind of life, so that they too can then uh, be immortal. They too can be uh, resurrected to spirit life. But as I said, at this time of year, those thoughts uh, tend to be tend to be uh, with us. And um, so we are, as I said, motivated by, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by our potential re uh, resurrection. We're motivated, therefore, to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And this time of the year, we are, we are physically unleavened, picturing being unleavened spiritually, picturing righteousness, having sin out of our lives. And so at this time of year, we can focus on values to remember four basic ethical principles that are a part of civilization and that are also based on scripture that the Bible reveals. Uh, and as I said, a secular organization uh, has, produced, has produced a four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Is it beneficial to all concerned? We can look at that from a biblical point of, 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 of view uh, or, or as I said, an ethicist would say there's the principle of autonomy. And so we have to understand that each human being is uh, created in the image of God and deserves you know, to be treated with honesty. We should be honest, right? And so truth is, 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 is certainly uh, something we, sh we should be uh, living. We should be, we should be speaking the truth. Secondly, each person is entitled to be treated fairly. There's the principle of justice, and that's also certainly in the Bible, that you know that God ultimately, as we know, is impartial. He has he treats each person according to what is best for that person. You know he he, he does not uh, treat what one is inferior to another, but what is best for that particular person. That's what he does, and he he's fair in that sense that he treats. He does the, what is best for everybody. Everybody gets what is best for, for him or her. And then a, another point is not to do harm uh, and, uh, or non-maleficence. And as we understand, doing no harm is a basic principle summarizing God's law. And then the fourth point uh, is the principle of beneficence, of doing good. And if we have the opportunity to do good, we do it. And again, that's also very much based on scriptures. So these four principles, the principle of autonomy, the principle of justice, <clears throat> the principle of non-maleficence, and the principle of beneficence, these four ethical, universal ethical principles are all found in the Bible and in effect emanate from the Bible because they, they come from the fact that God created human beings in his own image and human beings do have a sense of right and wrong. Unfortunately, it can be distorted, and we can make excuses. You know, the, the, we can be deceived, uh, as, as the Bible shows, uh, either by outside forces or just by our own 
um, selfishness at times. So we do need discipline. Societies have laws that they enforce for the good of society. And we as Christians, we as believers in, in the Word of God, we are guided and directed by God's Word. And so God, God's Word is the ultimate uh, decisor, so to speak. If that's the, I think that's the correct term. is the ultimate arbiter of, 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 of right and wrong. We go to the Word of God and we try to live by every word of God. So that is something that is a very important lesson of this festival season that is about to come to a conclusion. Values to remember. All the best to you and yours.